So, good morning. Yesterday we have seen one dimensional DCT. Okay. In today's session, okay, we will see the properties of DCT and then we will extend this one dimensional DCT to two dimensional DCT and after that we will start the wavelet transform. Okay. So, maybe we will take introduction of wavelet in today's lecture. Okay. So, the first property of this DCT is DCT is a linear transform. Okay. Everybody knows that what is by linearity? When we can say that system is linear or circuit is linear or when we can say that transform is linear? It should, yes? I am not getting what you are saying. Please loud. Hmm? Yeah, if that system obeys superposition principle, okay. If that system obeys superposition principle, then that system is said to be a linear system. Okay. Circuit also, if it obeys the superposition principle, then that circuit is called as the linear circuit. In the same way, transform is said to be a linear transform if it obeys the superposition principle. Means, suppose for example, if you have given a combined input, okay, you should get the effect. See, see this is suppose for example, the system you have given the input and then you have the output. Now, if x1 is given as the input to this system and if y1 is the output, now input is changed from x1 to x2, you will get the output y2. Okay. In the third case, what we are doing? Instead of separate input, you are giving the additional input of x1 plus x2. Your output, if that system is giving output equal to y1 plus y2, then that system is said to be linear system. In the same way, if you take the transform of this function, okay, transform of this combined function that is alpha p plus beta q, then it is equivalent to the transform of individual function, addition of individual function that is alpha transform, alpha is the constant, p is the function. So, plus beta is the constant and q is the function. So, this DCT also obeys this superposition principle means if you take the DCT of one signal, okay, you will get some DCT coefficient. If you take the DCT of another signal, you will get another DCT component. Okay. If you combine those two signals, the overall DCT will be the addition of first DCT and second DCT. So, this is the property of this cosine transform, discrete cosine transform. So, this property can be readily be proven by the DCT because it uses only simple arithmetic operations. Okay. Now, another important property of transform, this DCT transform is it is an orthogonal transform. Okay. Orthogonal transform. Now, what is by orthogonal function? when we can say that two functions are orthogonal to each other. Hmm? Yeah, yeah. If dot product is 0, okay. if the dot product of that two function, dot product between that two function is 0 or inner product of that one is 0, dot product is nothing but inner product is 0, then that those functions are said to be orthogonal function. Now, what is the advantage of having a function orthogonal? Why function should be or why transform should be orthogonal? Hmm? Okay, fine. That is mathematical property because p into q into uh, cos of theta. Okay. Basically, cos theta is this, theta is 90 degree. Okay. 
So that will be equal to P into Q because that's okay. Now, what is the advantage of transform being an orthogonal transform? Okay. First advantage of this transform, orthogonal transform is this transform is not redundant transform. Okay. It is not redundant transform. Now, what is the meaning of redundancy in the transform output? Okay. Whatever the output you are going to get, it is not redundant. Redundance means repetition. No? It is not repetition. It means, suppose for example, in a simple example, I will give that <coughs> you have a signal, input signal whose frequency is ranging from 0 to 10 kilohertz. Okay. Whose frequency is ranging from 0 to 10 kilohertz. And now you have two filters, one filter low pass filter and another one is high pass filter. Okay. Those two filters are designed such that cutoff frequency of each filter is 5 kilohertz. Cutoff frequency of each filter is 5 kilohertz. Now what will be the output of low pass filter? 0 to 5 kilohertz will be the output of low pass filter. And what will the output of high pass filter? From 5 kilohertz onward, okay, high pass filter will pass the signal. Now, the information captured by low pass filter, is it overlapping with the information captured by high pass filter? No, there is no overlapping between the information captured by low pass filter and high pass filter. So, such a design, we can say that these two filters are orthogonal to each other because that is not giving any redundant information. Okay. Now, now, in another example, so for example, you have designed, see, signal is same, but you have designed a low pass filter whose cutoff frequency is 7 kilohertz okay, and high pass filter whose cutoff frequency is 3 kilohertz. Okay. Now, what will the output of low pass filter? From 0 to 7 kilohertz output will be, there will be output of low pass filter and output of high pass filter will be right from 3 kilohertz onward. Now, the information between 3 kilohertz to 7 kilohertz, it is available at the output of low pass filter as well as high pass filter. Okay. Now, this say, this information is redundant in one of the output because it is available at both the places. So, such kind of design, we cannot say that it is a orthogonal design. Okay. So, orthogonal transform will give you non-redundant information, means every basis function, see, after all, this kernel function of that transform, we are deriving okay, several basis function. As I told you yesterday, in case of Fourier transform, how many basis functions you are derived from the kernel function? Infinite number of kernel functions you are deriving. Okay. In the same way in DCT also you can derive that one. Okay. So, each basis function will be capturing different information and not same information. It is not like that this basis function is capturing this information and then second basis function is also capturing or some of the part of this basis function uh, information is captured by the second basis function. So, information captured by first basis function is different than information captured by second and so on. Okay. So, this transform is orthogonal transform. Mathematically, how do you write this one? Okay. See that summation, see function BPI and BP, BQI are orthogonal if the product of BPI and BPQ, summation of the product of BP and BPQ is equal to 0, if P is not equal to Q. Okay. Now, simple way, so for example, you have a three-dimensional vector. Okay. You have a three-dimensional vector. Okay. Now, so for example, this is the axis x, this is the axis y and this is the axis z. Okay. 
Now you have the value of this point. Okay, this is one vector. Okay, this is another vector. Okay, and this is third vector. Now suppose, for example, these are the unit vectors. Okay, what will be the coordinate values of this one? Hmm. One zero zero. Okay, what will be the coordinate value of this y? It will be zero one zero, and what will be this one? Zero one or zero zero one. Okay. So if you write the vector x, which is nothing but one zero zero, vector y is zero one zero. Okay. Then vector z is Zero, zero, one. Now, if you take the dot product of x and y, okay, vector x and y, dot product of vector x and y will be the product between individual element that is one into zero plus zero into one plus zero into zero. So everything is zero. So dot product is zero. Same thing will happen with okay dot product between y and z and z and x. So all those vectors are orthogonal to each other. The okay angle between these two vector is 90 degree. Okay, angle between these two vector is 90 degree. So see that this function b p i and b q i are orthogonal. So this Functions are orthogonal to each other, provided p is not equal to q. See, the dot product between the same vector will be what? It will be one, na? Dot product between the same vector will be one. Okay, provided p is not equal to q. So, function p b p i and b q b q i are orthonormal. Okay, see, this is orthogonal, and function is said to be Normal if if this one okay uh, function B P I and B Q I are ortho uh, ortho normal if they are orthogonal and if B P I dot B Q I is equal to one if P is equal to one uh, if P is equal to Q. If p is equal to q, first thing is that so this should be zero, provided p is not equal to q, and if it is one, then this is ortho normal. So whatever we have drawn, what is this? All those vectors are ortho normal vectors. Okay, ortho normal vectors. Now see that the cosine basis function. Okay. It can be shown that, see this basis function is zero if if p is not equal to q and it will be equal to one if p is equal to q. So from that, what we can conclude? Cosine basis function is a orthonormal basis function. Okay, it is orthogonal as well as orthonormal. Now, when you extend, see that this transform is a separable transform. Okay, this transform is a Separable transform. So one-dimensional DCT can be extended to an image. Now image is a what is image? Image is a two-dimensional signal. So this is R1. This is Rm. Okay. So all those are the rows. This is column one and this is column n. Okay. Column one and column n. So intersection of This one, rows and column, is nothing but your pixel. Now, if you consider the first row, if you consider this first row, this is nothing but one vector. So we can consider this as one-dimensional signal. We can consider this as a one-dimensional. If you consider only one row, first row or second row, any row, this will be one-dimensional signal. Now, you can take the DCT of one-dimensional signal. Or uh, in the same way, if you consider only 
one column at a time, it will be again one dimensional signal. So, you, this, you can extend this one dimensional DCT to two dimensional DCT by applying it separably, that is apply it row wise and then column wise and then add the things because after all it is a linear transform, no? It is a linear and separable transform. Okay. Now see that this is the graphical illustration of 8 by 8 two dimensional DCT basis function. Okay. Now see that what happens with this one? See when u is equal to 0, v is equal to 0. So for example, this is u and this is v. When u is equal to 0, v is equal to 0, at that time what kind of frequency component you are going to find? Hmm? 0 means it is DC. Okay? So, so, for example, <coughs> if you are considering, okay, if you are considering this one, uh, 0 as 1, okay, 0 as white, okay, consider 0 as white and 1 as black or vice versa. Okay, it is uh, this one. Now, suppose for example, u is 0, v is 0. So, intersection of u and v, see, 0, 0, we are considering white. So, intersection of both function will be equal to white. So, you got this basis function entirely, first left corner function is completely white, means it is capturing what? Hmm? Say that, suppose for example, this is your white, this is also white. So, white into white will be equal to white, resultant will be white. Okay. So, you got white. Now, your u is constant in first row. If you are considering this as a u, okay, rows as a u and columns as a v, if in the first row your u is constant, so u is equal to 0. Okay. Now, in the first column, what is v? v is also equal to 0. See, value of u is 0 here, u equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and 7. Similarly, in the column side, your v is equal to 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and 7. Now, if you consider the top left corner, okay, at that time you have u equal to 0 and v is equal to 0 means both are white, so product will be equal to white. Now, consider the first row means this one or 0th row, you can consider this as the 0th row or first row, whatever is that. Okay. Now, if you consider the second one, okay. Now, you have basically, see that, you have u function like this, but v function, see v function is having half portion white okay, and half portion black, okay, half portion white and half portion black. Now, what will be this one? If you take the product between this one and this one, what will be the result one? It will be like this. Okay, 1 into 1 will be equal to 1, but 1 into 0 will be equal to 0. So, this is basically, suppose for example, this portion is 1, this entire is 1, but this is 0. So, product of that one will be equal to 1 and 0. So, you got half portion white and half portion black. Now, when u is equal to 2, okay, when u is equal to 2, now instead of 2 bands, there will be 3 bands that is white, black, white, but your u is same. So, if you multiply that one, you will again get the same like as a v. Okay. So, like that way, your v is increasing up to what? v is equal to 7, means you will get total 8 bands. Okay. 
colors for example white black white black and so on but your u is equal to 0 so that will be your resultant basis function when u is equal to 0 v equal to 7 now come back to here so your in this row your u is equal to 1 means your basis function will be having See, this is taking care of column and this is taking care of rows. Now, here there are two rows. One is basically this is white. Suppose, for example, this is white and this is black. Now, when so here you have this black portion and this is white portion. But now, what is this basically? See, here you have this one, but what about? Uh, v, v is entire geo means white, so you will get same thing. Now, when V is equal to 1, okay, V is equal to 1 and U is equal to 1, you have this U component and V component will be how, how, how it will look like? It will be vertical, so for example, like this. Now, product of this one will be equal to what? You will get the four patterns like this. One is white, black black white so like that way now this is constant for this row and number of columns are increasing so you will get the pattern like this so this will be the basis function for u equal to 1 and v equal to 7 this is the basis function for u equal to 1 and v equal to 6 and so on now like that way when you are increasing u okay your horizontal patterns will increase. When you are increasing V, your vertical patterns will increase. Now, at the end, what will happen? You will be having 8 component. We will be having 8 component. Intersection of that one will look like this one. Now, okay, if you look the spatial frequency, you know that spatial frequency, how do you define the spatial frequency? Rate of change of pixel intensity is larger. So, definitely, in this basis function, the rate of change of pixel intensity is larger, whereas here, rate of change of pixel intensity is less. So, this will capture the, this basis function will capture the low spatial frequency component, whereas this basis function will capture the, okay, high base, uh, spatial frequency component. Means, for every spatial frequency, there is a special different basis function. So, what do you do basically? You convolve this one or you find out the correlation between this basis function and your original signal. Then you find out the correlation between this one and this one and so you will get the DCT coefficient. So, when you are considering a 8 by 8 image block, okay, you, you have this 8 by 8 two dimensional DCT basis function, you are going to convolve that one and then you will get the different frequency component. So, for example, if your 8 by 8 basis function or 8 by 8 image block is completely white, means all the pixels are having 255 value. Okay. So, what is the special frequency in that? 0. So, there will be more correlation of that image, original image block with this basis function, but there will be less correlation between this one. So, DCT coefficient at this location will be minimum, whereas DCT uh, coefficient at this location will be maximum. Okay. So, like that way you are calculating the DCT coefficients of the image. I hope that it is clear. Okay. So, this is the 2D DCT separable basis. Okay. First, what you do? You do convolution row wise and then column wise and then this simply changes the cells many arithmetic steps and the number of iteration required is to 8 by 8 to 8 plus 8 okay okay so this finishes your discrete cosine transform so in that we have studied one dimensional dct then properties of dct okay how to find out the dct of a given function or given sequence and then the property of DCT and after that we have studied the two dimensional DCT and the basis function of this two dimensional DCT. Now, we will start the next transform and that is wavelet transform. Okay, so,
wavelet is my favorite topic because I have designed my own wavelet in my PhD. Okay. And near about more than 200 lectures I have delivered outside HGS on wavelet only. So, it has become like as Varad Nigala London La for me. Okay. Anyway, so what is wavelet basically? Okay. So, wavelet is a tool. Okay, wavelet is a tool. Now, everybody has used tool in first year? Yes or no? For what purpose? Huh? For first year workshop, have you done the workshop? Okay. For preparing different kind of jobs, you have used the different tools. Now, what kind of tools you have used? Huh? Hammer you have used, then files, hacksaw and so on. Okay. Now, do you think that this hammer is used only for one particular job or it can be used for any kind of job? It can be used for any kind of job, no? Okay. Only thing is that, okay, uh, the job of that particular tool is fixed. Means suppose for example, if you take the hacksaw, the job of hacksaw is to cut the things. Okay. You can cut any job, only thing is that operation is same. In the same way, wavelet is also a tool which can be used in any signal. Okay which can be used for any signal. Now, for what purpose it is used? It can be used for analysis or it can be used for synthesis purpose. Okay. Now, what is my analysis of the signal? Yes, finding the attributes of the signal. Okay. For example, hmm? frequency content. Okay, generally, I give one example. I think I, in your class also, in, I, I might have given that one earlier. That shows, for example, if you have been asked to do the analysis of this cup of tea, how do you do the analysis of this cup of tea? Everybody have a cup of tea, no? Yes or no? Okay. If I ask you people to do the analysis of this cup of tea, how you will do the analysis of this cup of tea? Hmm? I am not getting. Hmm? So, what is the size of this cup of tea? A bigger cup or smaller cup? Okay. Then, temperature. Okay. Very good. Hmm? Test. Okay. Then, hmm? color. Okay. Then, so you have given me all those attributes like as a test, color, then shape, or for example, the size. Now, see that analysis is exactly opposite to synthesis. Now, see, I have done the analysis of this cup of tea that yes, this cup of tea or cup, this cup of tea is of this size, what is the color of this one, okay. Then, what is the temperature of this one? Now, all those attributes I have extracted from this one. So, if I add all those attributes together, will I get the cup of tea back? Yes or no? Means size, test, temperature. Okay, I have added all those things. I should get back the cup of tea. Will I get? Then that analysis is wrong, no? Hmm? Okay, basically what are the ingredients of this cup of tea? See, if we do the analysis of this cup of tea, like for example, this cup of tea contains half cup water half cup milk, then two teaspoon sugar, one teaspoon tea and some adrak masala and everything is there. So, you have separated all those ingredients from this cup of tea. So, this process is called as analysis. Now, synthesis is exactly opposite. Okay. 
first you have done the separation now you will do the addition means if you take half cup water if you add half cup milk then if you add one two teaspoon sugar one then one teaspoon tea and then some adrak and all those things and if you boil it what you'll get you'll get the cup of tea you'll get the cup of tea so this process is called as the synthesis and now in signal processing also okay you need a tools which will do the analysis of signal and synthesis of the signal okay now <clears throat> why it is necessary in the signal processing why analysis and synthesis is essential now for example if i strike a tuning fork what kind of signal i'll get if i strike a tuning fork i'll get the signal whose frequency is constant okay and it is having a single frequency so this kind of signal is there but now if i utter a word like for example wavelet this microphone what it will do it will convert sound energy into electrical and then it will be given to the amplifier and then recording will be done so this if you visualize this recorded signal b okay how it will be it will be some speech signal something something like that okay now does this signal have a single frequency or it is a combination of several frequencies it is a combination of several frequencies now analysis of first signal is easy or second signal is easy first one because it contains only one frequency component okay now definitely in its original domain you can tell what is the frequency of this one how by measuring the time period 1 by t is nothing but the frequency but if i ask you people to find out the what are the reference frequency component in signal b is it possible no so we should have some tools which will extract the frequency content of that signal okay so definitely there are several tools available like as a fourier transform okay this is a well known tool okay so <clears throat> now what we are going to do after doing the analysis of the signal for what purpose it is necessary in real world application what is the use of doing the analysis of the signal means suppose for example i have done the analysis of this signal i got what are the frequency component of this one so suppose for example this signal contains pi hertz 15 kilohertz and 10 kilohertz frequency is there in that signal analysis is done okay now if i add those things i'll get the original signal back okay what is the use of doing the analysis of signal in real world application for example what is the use after all okay mm -hmm. you can remove that one unwanted part okay or simple example for example you are designing a system which will recognize the speaker okay speaker recognition system speaker recognition see there is a difference between speech recognition and speaker in speech recognition what do you do you try to identify what has been spoken okay and in speaker recognition you are trying to identify who has spoken that one see in speech you try to identify what has been spoken and in speaker recognition you are trying to identify who has spoken now so for example here you have three four samples like for example you have recorded my signal okay again samples from your group three four samples now i would like to know okay after playing that one okay when you replay that signal you'll get the sound in uh, this one uh, uh, sound energy okay now i would like to know who has spoken that one okay so i have to identify the person 
Huh? Okay, the correlation will be there, but basically what you have to do? See, my features are different than your features, so nobody is similar. Everybody is unique. So everybody's voice is different, everybody's face is different, everything is different. So something uniqueness is there and that uniqueness we call it as a feature. Feature of that person or feature of that system. Okay. So by using these tools we can, you, we are extracting the feature of that thing. Okay. Means so for example, okay, I may be speaking with different frequency, you may be speaking with different frequency. So my frequency will be different if I do the analysis of my own signal, my frequency will be different. Okay. Your own analysis, your frequency will be different. So once I know that, okay, a frequency of my speech is something this one, frequency of this one is something this one. So if this is known and now when unknown pattern comes and if that frequency matches with this one, I can say that this is, okay, this person or this is that person, okay. So like that way for identification or recognition purpose or regression or for forecasting, you can use these tools for extracting the features. Okay. And then synthesis, for what purpose synthesis is used? See, you have recon this extracted the things. Okay. You have separated all those ingredients. Now, to build up that thing, okay, you need to do the synthesis. Means, for example, okay, in case of compression, okay, you do the compression and at the uh, receiver side, you do the decompression. Okay, this coded signal is again decoded, okay, inverse transformed, okay, decontized and inverse transformed and then what you get? You get the original signal, okay. So, this is nothing but synthesis, okay. Now, so there are several tools available for doing the analysis and synthesis. Now, this wavelet, okay, is used in many fields. For example, okay, we would like to develop the system which will make operation of mechanical machines. Okay, we would like to develop the system which will measure the vibration of mechanical machines. So, how to do that one? So, with that machine, if you attach a vibration sensor, it will record the vibration. So, if there is no vibration, your signal will be smooth. There will not be any change in amplitude. But if there is lot of vibration, then there will be lot of changes in the signal. So, if you record that one with respect to time, what kind of signal you will get? Is it a one dimensional signal or two dimensional signal or n dimensional signal? See, when you are record, see what kind of, what is this signal? Is it a one dimensional signal or two dimensional signal? Okay, I think I have studied, um, talked about that one in very first lecture because number of independent variables here is time and independent is amplitude. Here also it is time and so now dimension of the signal is decided by number of independent variables. Okay, so in case of your mechanical machine also if vibrations are recorded with respect to time, so this is the amplitude and this is the signal. Okay. And this is with respect, this is recorded with respect to time. Okay. So, this mechanical signal, vibration signal is a one dimensional signal or two dimensional signal? One dimensional. Okay. Speech signal, one dimensional. If you record ECG, it is recorded with respect to time now. So, it is again one dimensional signal. Okay. So, or for example, a seismic signal, if there is a earthquake, if there is an earthquake, then you will get the seismic signal. So, recording of that seismic signal with respect to time is one dimensional signal. Now, all those signals, seismic signal or vibration signal or speech signal or ACG signal, they are one dimensional signal. Now, all those signals are stationary signal or non-stationary signal? See, this signal is stationary or non-stationary? 
this is stationary because if you take any portion of this one, the frequency of that signal remains constant. Okay, that is why this signal is considered as a stationary signal. Whereas, non stationary signal means if you take different portion of the signal or different window size, the frequency at this one, this between this and this window is different than this one and this one and so on. So, frequency occurring at different instant of time is different. Same is there with your mechanical vibration, same is there with your seismic signal and so on. Okay. So, all those such signals are non-stationary signals. Now, what do you think? In real world, you will find more number of stationary signals or non-stationary signals non stationary signals okay so we need to do the analysis of this non stationary signal to identify the systems okay so wavelet is one of the tool for doing this one means see that when the signal is recorded after all it is a signal na we don't know whether it is coming from mechanical system or whether it is coming from okay earthquake uh, or whether it is coming from speech or ecg something something that okay wavelet does not know wavelet will do the analysis of those signals. Okay. So, this wavelet is used in diverse field of application means it is used not it is not only used in electrical or electronics engineering for doing the analysis of signal, but it can be used in mechanical engineering, can be used in earthquake or earth science, uh, it can be used in chemical engineering, it can be used in civil engineering or in physics and so on. So, wavelet is a tool which is used everywhere for doing the analysis of the signal. Okay. Now, this is also called, wavelet is also called as a mathematical microscope. Wavelet is also called as a mathematical microscope. What microscope does? Hmm? You might have used that one in 12th class now, 11, 12th or you are not done practical. Hmm? What microscope does? Huh? It magnifies the things which are not visible with our naked eyes. Okay? So, if you magnify that one, it is re visible. In the same way, we can magnify the signal or we can do the analysis right from high frequency to low frequency by changing the scale of the wavelet. Okay? So, wavelet is also called as a mathematical microscope. Okay. Now, for doing the study of this wavelet, okay, how many books are available? Definitely, here I have written how many? Three, must be more than three, no? or at least three. What do you think? How many books are available to study wavelet? Hmm? Any number? More than three. Now you convinced. <laughs> okay, in 2006, okay, I think in 2005 I got career out for young teacher. Okay, and under that award, I got 10.5 lakh rupees okay, as award money. And this 10.5 lakh rupees was every year 1.5 lakh rupees was for visiting foreign universities to present my research work, to visit labs and so on. So, under that I visited USA 5 times, Singapore 2 times, then Bangkok, Malaysia, Cambridge University, Oxford University, London and then Spain. And then, in that award, okay, 1.5 lakh rupees was given for purchasing the tablet PC. So, at that time I purchased, now it is not working, so I purchased new one. Okay. And another thing is that, every year they gave me 50,000 rupees for purchasing the books and 60,000 rupees for purchasing the any material, whatever I required to carry out the research means pen, pencil, material, okay, notebook and so on and 50,000 rupees to travel within India. 
every year. Okay. So, it was between 2005 to 2008, so I continued to, up to 2009. Okay. So, in 2007, I thought that I will purchase a books of 50,000 rupees on violet only. Okay. So, I was searching a books on violet on Amazon.com and you know that in 2007, I got near about 20,000 titles on violet means near about 20,000 books are available related to Wavelet. Okay. Now, if so many books are available, which one you should refer to study the Wavelet? There will be confusion now. Okay. So, out of that, I found for beginners, the first book is quite good book, that is, which is written by Wavelet Transform Introduction to Theory and Application by Rao and Bopadikar. One more book recently published and it is Wavelet Transform by K. P. Soman. He is author from Chennai. Okay. That book is also a very nice book to understand the Wavelet concept. Okay. Then those who want to do the more detailed study of Wavelet, okay. those who want to do more detailed study of Wavelet, they can refer the second one with mathematical background and so on. That is Violet and Filter Bank by Gilbert Stang. Okay. And those who want to do the research in multi channel Violet, okay, there is third book which is written by Introduction to Violet and Violet Transform, a primer written by Gopinath and Boros, Sidney Boros. This Gopinath was doing his PhD at Rice University under Professor Sidney Boros. So, Rice University is one of the top group in the world. Okay. That group is working on the Bevelet only. Okay. Several people are working on the Bevelet. Okay. In Singapore also, NEO Singapore, there is a separate department on Bevelet in NEO Singapore. Actually, I got a Postdoctoral opportunity there in 2007, but I could not join as a postdoctoral fellow. Okay. So, there is a separate department of Wavelet. So, Wavelet has become a very, very important and hot topic nowadays. Okay. So, here this Gopinath in his PhD, he designed several kind of Wavelet, like as a multi channel Wavelet, M band Wavelet, Cosan moderated Wavelet, and so on. And after his PhD, Okay, his thesis was converted into the book and the name of that book is Introduction to Wavelet, Wavelet Transform a Primer, okay, which is written by Gopinath and Sidney Burroughs. So, as I told you that, there are, say in 2007 there were 20,000 books, so nowadays it must be more than 25,000 books at least. Okay. Who has written all those books? Okay, who has designed the Wavelet basically? Mainly Wavelet is designed by the mathematician and it is used by engineers and physicists. Okay. So, we do the application of that one, whereas the actual design mostly, if you see the literature, it is designed by the mathematician. Okay. So, you will find that some of the books are really written by Mathematicians, some of the books are written by engineers. In engineering also, there are several applications. Some of the books are written by physicists and so on. Okay. So, if you read the book which is written by mathematician, so there is one more book which is written by mathematician. She is a lady. Okay. Her name is Ingrid Dabochitz. Okay. Professor Ingrid Dabochitz. Okay. She has converted her 10 lectures on Wavelet into a book. Okay. The title of that book is 10 lectures on Wavelet. Okay. But if you read that book, I do not think that even 100 lectures are sufficient for digesting that book or understanding that book, because everything is written in mathematical formulas. Okay. Though mathematics is compulsory to take admission in engineering, okay. but 
when people goes for research every most of the engineers hate mathematics they read research paper how they read they read the text whenever equation comes that equation will be skipped and then next part will be read see you might have you might be referring papers for your project do you really understand the equation of that paper okay it's not so easy but not so difficult also if you take the interest in that okay so those who hate mathematics for them there is one very good book okay and it is written by okay a author who is neither mathematician nor engineer nor physicist c is just art graduated ma in english now question is that where is the relation of ma english with bevelet okay so her major qualification is her husband is great mathematician her husband is great mathematician so he used to interpret those equation in very simple language and she used to write all those equations in simple text form okay so if you try to understand if you want to understand wavelet without mathematics okay she has written a book and the title of that book is world according to wavelet world according to wavelet by Barbara Hubbard World according to wavelet by Barbara Hubbard okay so those who want to understand wavelet and in very simple language they can refer this book means e1 c has not written a section number forget about the summation integration and then this variables and so on nothing is there okay everything is bulleted okay and in text form so understanding the concept of fourier transform or shorten fourier transform or wavelet transform is really really easy in this book okay so one can refer that book i think we'll stop here and in our tomorrow's lecture not tomorrow on tuesday's lecture we'll continue with this one so thank you very much